the idea of the talk is uh, to uh, show um, some example of how we can use patient data to understand uh, bilingualism in general, but uh, a special focus on uh, language processing. So I did also some research on cognitive research, say, say the bilingual advantage in the context of dementia or cognitive decline. I don't talk about this, this part, but if you have some question about uh, also uh, the research uh, in this field, such as uh, cognitive research, feel free to ask in the, during the uh, question uh, session. So uh, I would like to start to, uh, with some uh, definition uh, in case you are not uh, familiar with the idea of cognitive neuropsychology or the, or the neuropsychology in general. So uh, traditionally and how we know we used to define a neuropsychology, especially cognitive neuropsychology, is the uh, research and the study of the organization of uh, uh, language or cognition uh, from, uh, uh, from, from patients. So the, the common point maybe uh, between uh, cognitive neuropsychology and cognitive neuroscience, in more general terms, is, is, is the brain. Okay, but from a cognitive uh, uh, psychology, cognitive neuropsychology started with the idea to uh, look at the architecture, architecture of the of, of the processes, and the cognitive neuroscience more on the relation uh, between uh, brain and function. So uh, we can say that the main or the, the crucial aspect of the cognitive neuropsychology was and is for many uh, to uh, show that. Uh, uh, after uh, brain damage, uh, we can see some processes that are spared, but some processes are affected by the disease. So is this difference between uh, what is preserved and what is spared uh, that uh, make uh, uh, the, 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 the focus of the cognitive psychology. So on the other hand, uh, cognitive neuroscience is more related to correlate the brain activity, let's say, of functional structures uh, to a language of uh, cognitive disorder or cognitive function. Okay, so the, 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 the difference is, uh, let's say, uh, the level of explanation in terms of a neural neural network. It is true that uh, today uh, sometimes the, the two the two terms are, are mixed, or people that started with cognitive psychology and now are doing more cognitive neuroscience. But uh, let's say that the strong uh, definition of cognitive psychology is uh, more on uh, a cognitive 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 level. So. Uh, to, to, to how we, we, we can approach uh, uh, the study of the function in, in patient. The idea is that you uh, see uh, uh, a patient with, with a lesion and then uh, to understand the behavior that patient is, has now after the, 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 the lesion, uh, and it's, it can be a language impairment or an impairment in other uh, cognitive process, you have to think about how these, uh, these processes are described by the model uh, of the cognitive psychology. I say it's a cognitive psychology because uh, for, uh, for, for many, uh, we, we say cognitive neuropsychology because it's the study of the cognitive psychology in the context of, of brain damage. So for example, if you have two different system of reading, two different path, uh, pathways of, of reading, one based or, uh, uh, for example, uh, the phoneme and grapheme information, and one would based on lexical properties of the words, and you have a lesion, you can test if it's true uh, by uh, looking at uh, the patient with language uh, disorder and see if one is, is preserved and one is spared. And so I conclude that the two uh, pathways are, are, are dissociated. So the idea of dissociation come, um, come from, comes from the, uh, this concept or this definition of the architecture of our uh, mind, of our cognition that is based on modularity. Modularity is a, is, a, is a theory, let's say, of philosophy uh, that uh, further described in the 80s. And the, uh, the idea is that 
uh, uh, the cognitive function are gonna organize in terms of modules. That is, modules that doesn't uh, modules doesn't mean uh, a system of information. It's not a question of representation of the information, but instead we can think about uh, a, a series of, of of processes, cognitive processes. And uh, in the uh, original description of these modules, uh, there is the idea that uh, uh, for defining a module in uh, photo stirs uh, the modules work in independent uh, manner and say that they uh, don't share uh, any kind of information they are specific to uh, the input that you have to uh, process and uh, importantly uh, and each module has a specific neural uh, um, neural area that is uh, um, dependent or the specific era that is processing this, this kind of uh, information. So we have to say that nowadays these assumptions of modularity is not so strict as in uh, the first uh, original idea of photos and uh, also cognitive psychology, but uh, the idea of conceptualizing neuropsychology as a uh, different uh, uh, processes that can be damaged or spared is, is useful in terms of uh, conceptual conceptual terms. So this means that uh, especially the uh, neural specificity is not a kind of requirement that is also essential uh, in, in nowadays cognitive psychology. So the question is, uh, is cognitive psychology plausible in the sense that can we think in the in, in strong terms of cognitive psychology, can we study really uh, cognitive processes in patients with brain damage without uh, any problem or there are some limitations uh, that uh, uh, make uh, the study uh, difficult or have some data that are not reliable in the end when you study this in, in patient with brain damage. So of course there are some limitations and some limitation comes from different sorts of problems that we have when we, we do research. And in the, especially in the context of cognitive psychology, uh, for example, uh, we, have the problem that sometimes uh, patients have more than one than one deficit. Uh, so uh, it, this does not mean that because they have multiple brain lesions, but sometimes it's only because one lesion can have the consequence to uh, to more than one deficit in in, in the in the main um, domain of language, but also. For executive control, we have that. We know that in the, in the context of Asia, we see that problem, patient have also problem in executive control. So, can uh, executive control may affect also the ability of lexical retrieval. And uh, in some many cases, when you have to think about how to conceptualize the research in terms of cognition, and um, this is um, this can be difficult because we don't have a, a strong cognitive model behind, behind. So it's a difficult same time to test the cognitive model or to, to, to test the hypothesis because the cognitive model uh, is not uh, well detailed in all, all the processes. This sometimes happens in, in the field of bilingualism. We have some proposal uh, of what is going on in our brain and less maybe at cognitive level. So this is difficult to test when you, when you have to test this in patient. And also uh, we have different theories and this makes it difficult to test uh, all the theories or sometimes if you don't find uh, uh, the results uh, uh, that are uh, in, uh, that agree uh, with what is suspected from the model, we have also some alternative, alternative uh, explanation to these results. So uh, we can think uh, in, about uh, these strong concepts of cognitive uh, neuropsychology, and this makes some difficult because all, not all the assumptions uh, can be can be followed. Uh, but we can also think about to uh, have more integrative or comprehensive view uh, of the of the uh, cognitive neuropsychology in the field of bilinguals, for example, by putting uh, as a way to integrate and complement different source of information of evidence of one, one phenomenon. So uh, I just put this definition by 
by cos by coslin uh, who argued that it's, it's it's true that we can do some strong continuous psychology but also we can uh, uh, do more let's say weak you know, continuous psychology and we use also and use this data uh, to um, to um, to complement what we know about the brain and possibly uh, computational computational modeling so I will try to to use uh, this uh, more uh, this more comprehensive uh, uh, approach of the uh, neuropsychology uh, in in the rest of in the rest of my talk with some example specifically uh, adapted to to bilingualism. So, uh, so the idea um, to 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 complement all the information and and especially in the field of bilingualism, I think that. We know more about uh, the cognitive research side of bilingualism more than the on the neuropsychological side. It is true that we have a long tradition. Michel Paradis was one of the first pioneers who worked in this field. Nowadays, um, most of the research that we do on bilingual aphasia uh, are based also on the first concept, uh, concepts and also some tools, as like, as like uh, uh, for example, the bilingual aphasia test was designed many years ago, but nowadays I think we have less and less evidence uh, from, from patient and bilingual patient with, uh, with, uh, with brain damage. And I think it's, uh, it's something that we have to promote and, and do more because uh, sometimes I mean, patients that are very, 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 very useful to understand some language properties of in, 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 in the field of bilingualism. So uh, from the, uh, the idea so is to move from the uh, cognitive neuroscience perspective and to do what we can do uh, with, with, with patient. So just uh, uh, a few, few, few information about the cognitive uh, neuroscience of bilingualism. Probably we, we know most of, of these things. And according to the general model of uh, bilingualism uh, for um, uh, for cognitive neuroscience, from cognitive science perspective, we know that uh, as uh, Jubin Abutalevi and David Green have published many, many, uh, the first, let's say, neural model, and in, in the last year also an adaptation of this model to interactional, uh, interactional context. And we know that we have a, a more subcortical network specifically that uh, from basal ganglia, this is a structure that is crucial uh, in language activation and language inhibition, for example, and it is connected with more anterior uh, part of the brain, specifically with this complex that's the ante anterior uh, single cortex and premotor um, premotor area. Uh, this uh, uh, network is uh, specifically related to uh, uh, language activation and language reconfiguration. I would say uh, this is in, in terms that I, I prefer and I, I use in. In some study uh, with patients uh, who had problems in basal ganglia, and the, this uh, ACC area is more uh, connected to language uh, monitoring. I say in context in which we have some cross language interference, is the area that is helping in in in, in control and monitor this this interference situation, and then the let's say the intentionality to speak a language is more related to uh, to, to, to the prefrontal, prefrontal part of the brain. The other cortical area that is important within the network is the, uh, the right of cortex. And uh, Juby, uh, Kalevi, and Green uh, agree that uh, this area is more relevant in uh, maintaining the language active during the conversation or in maintaining in the kind of uh, memory buffer, working memory buffer in which we uh, store the information and to maintain the, this, the language schema when, while we are speaking in a specific language. So the, 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 the first example I give you uh, now is are more related to um, this function over the basal ganglia structure because we started to do a uh, study on this. And uh, it's true that this is a crucial uh, uh, structure uh, in, in, in the field of uh, neuropsychology of bilingualism because probably the first evidence of uh, that, that the structure is really important in, 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 in language activation in bilinguals comes from, uh, from uh, patient data. 
So especially from single single case uh, data and single case data uh, have uh, been one of the source of um, information in the language in the, in the language field because uh, neuropsychology of language have provided a lot of uh, contribution uh, from single case studies and the single case studies is a kind of special situation for research uh, when we have uh, to, to implement a scientific approach or use the scientific methods in, in, in single case studies is a, a special situation because uh, we see, uh, we observe a situation in which the, the person is speaking with some errors or who has some problem in comprehension or, in the, in, or uh, cannot speak one with the language or have problem in mixing uh, uh, some, 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 some component, some linguistic component, or some morphological structure from one, one language to the other. And then from these uh, observations, sometimes at the clinical level, we have to move to more uh, theoretical, let's say, level, which have to explain this behavior, behavior in terms of uh, what is going on and, uh, and, and which are the processes that are affected in this person and how we can explain this uh, observation in terms of cognitive model or linguistic model of of um, of bilingualism. So to do uh, uh, to do research in 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 patient and to do single case uh, study, I think we have to keep in mind some 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 rules or or some uh, I yes some some rules of uh, to with the aim of uh, having uh, in the end good 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 data a good, good good information that is useful to to understand and, and to to make a contribution so when we uh, study single case patient uh, it's 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 useful to test and retest the the, the person uh, because if you want to show that uh, exceptional behavior that we observe is is it's really true and, and the, the deficit is there it's it's, it's useful to test and retest the person with the, the, the same the same uh, the same tasks or uh, change the task in a way that we want to explore something something different but keep constant the, the observation to have enough data because the, one of the problems that we have we are testing only one person so maybe uh, use more items or more more mm, more session of, of the same task so my my point of view is to use uh experimental tasks so if, if you want to to test uh, some something in board production you can go back to uh, uh studies that publish for example with healthy individuals and uh, uh, to reuse the same task or just modify to to, to patient needs and this is uh, this has an advantage because we can make better prediction based from based on previous studies with healthy individuals and then once we have the data we have, can also uh, it will be easier to 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 explain it to interpret the the, the results and the funding the funding that we have from 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 the patient so the the other idea when we have to to design the the task or or, or the, the, the hypothesis think about uh, in terms of dissociation so how i want to test this this linguistic uh, process and how i can i test uh, other aspects of the same process or other processes in terms of showing that something is paired but this and something is affected this is important because one of the criticisms is that uh, brain damage can affect everything. So we have to, we are, we need to show that if it's, what is affected is this patient is affected in a specific way and not uh, all the condition of the person is affected uh, because of the, the, the brain damage. So ideally also is to uh, uh, test the hypothesis in patient with focal, focal lesions. So this is, uh, an advantage because uh, if patient has a uh, focal lesion, uh, we probably have the chance to observe specific uh, deficit as well. This is an ideal situation and sometimes we have to deal with patients uh, who have um, uh, um, not specific 
uh, lesion or more than one lesion. Uh, so uh, this is a kind of ideal situation, uh, but uh, we have to think about what is the consequence of having uh, more uh, widespread lesion, for example. So uh, I uh, show you uh, one of the first cases that we study uh, some years ago, and we studied with, uh, with, uh, with Albert. And I describe this, this situation because it's uh, the typical situation when we, uh, uh, we see uh, uh, um, a patient with a problem and we have to explain what's going on. So this was a, a patient that uh, was a Catalan Spanish speaker and the patient uh, was uh, highly proficient in both languages and the patient was used uh, to speak almost of the time in, in, in Catalan. So we can say that her dominant language was, was Catalan. And at some point, uh, her daughter and also the neurologist observed that uh, the patient was not able to stick with the back language during the conversation. And she frequently switched uh, to Spanish, that Spanish was uh, her uh, second language, in the sense that uh, had the same say, language proficiency as in Catalan, but in terms of uh, frequency of uh, use was not the, 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 first, the first language. So what we did, we, we tested uh, first uh, the, the patient uh, with uh, some, uh, some uh, uh, in, in connected speech. So connected speech, it's, it's really important because you got a lot of information, not only uh, uh, how many words the person is, is producing, but also you can see a real uh, setting of, 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 of conversation or description of a complex uh, figure. So we repeat it several times. And actually what we observe in terms of how many words that the patient produced, uh, the, the same in, in both languages. But what we observed was that uh, when the patient was asked to restrict uh, her uh, speech production to, to Catalan, show uh, more uh, switches to uh, to Spanish, and in the end, she produced more uh, words uh, in um, in Spanish than, than than in Catalan when it was tested in, in Catalan. But uh, the, the the interesting thing, at least for me at the beginning, was that this this was there was kind of directionality of the behavior. We didn't see the same effect on Spanish when the patient was tested in Spanish. She didn't have uh, uh, any any problem to do the task. And she did, uh, she did few switch to Catalan and few switch only for few words. And then the condition was that she moved, she switched to the other language, was not able to, to go back to, to Catalan. So the, the idea is that this is happening also uh, at more lexical level. So we started with doing some picture naming tasks. And what we observed that uh, at, uh, for object naming, the case it was that um, she had some problem in, 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 in naming, okay? But there was no specific language specific deficit. So we, we say, okay, probably this is happening only uh, when the patient has to produce long sentences or patient had to, uh, is engaged in a, in a conversation. So when we, uh, uh, we, we tested the patient in production naming, uh, so the the reason to 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 divide these two categories because uh, the neuropsychology of languages uh, um, show that uh, we have this, this 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 possible association in in in, in naming. Okay, in, in most of the cases, is uh, action naming uh, that is more related to uh, frontal lesion. Let's say object naming more temporal lesion. It's not always the case, but it's there. So, and when we went to uh, look at the, what kind of errors uh, the, patient, uh, the patient did, we saw that uh, there was uh, some, semantic, uh, some semantic error. This is probably due because the patient had also some lesion at, at temporal, um, temporal lobe and probably she had some, some semantic uh, difficulties. But uh, what we found is, uh, is that uh, the uh, errors that she, she did in action naming uh, task uh, was mainly, uh, the errors were mainly uh, cross-language intrusions and uh, cross-language intrusion when uh, she uh, was required to do the task in Catalan, but not, uh, but not in Spanish. So we found that 
there was some problem also in lexical level that was restricted to 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 to, to verbs and uh, the the interesting thing is that after uh, uh, looking at the action naming uh, data we, we we thought that it was useful to go back to, to connect the speech and actually what, what we found that the number uh, of uh, uh, switch that the patient uh, did during connected speech was higher for verbs than the noun. So the patient started to say one sentence with the, the subject in, in, in Catalan, and then when she had to produce a verb, she switched to Spanish. So it was interesting this association that we found between uh, naming and, and connected speech. So also we, uh, we, we tried to look at the uh, uh, whether it was a problem of frequency, so we uh, selected uh, some some objects with very low frequency. So uh, the idea is that if we make the task difficult in 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 object naming, probably we are able to see some 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 deficits. But it was not the case. At least the patient still had a problem in naming. But this was um, the the, the error that she she she. She produced uh, were not uh, were not uh, cross language intrusion, and also uh, we uh, try to uh, collect more data and uh, to show the patient a series of of of, uh, of uh, complex figures or or complex uh, objects and ask the patient to 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 repeat to to, to stick with the same language for. Uh, some some trials and the patient was able to do this in in Spanish, but every time that we we switched to Catalan, she was able to 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 stick the same with the same language for two three items, but after, after three four items, she was not able. She wasn't able to let's say maintain the language, and she went back to 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 Spanish again. So at that point, we we decided to use to a more formal formal task. So. This is the language switching task. Probably uh, you, at some point, we have heard about uh, this this paradigm. We, we present a set of pictures and with the flag, and the flag is indicating you the the, the naming language. And uh, and uh, at some point, you have several trials with the same language. We see repeat trials or non-state or state trials or non switch trial, depends on. On the terminology, but in general we call it a state trial. And in, in at some point you see uh, the, the 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 flag is changing, saying that you have to change, you have to change uh, your language. So the frequency of of uh, switch trials uh, is uh, depends on, on the manipulation you want to do. But in this case uh, we use a, a frequency of thirty percent of a switch trial. Uh, on the total of 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 the the trial that we presented to to, to the patient. So, what we uh, what we observed uh, is that similarly what we we have found in in uh, in the connected speech, uh, the patient was was uh, was able uh, was not able to do the task. Let's say in terms this is the results in terms of of errors. This is the the control. The first column is data. Uh, from from healthy individuals without brain brain damage, and this is the performance of the patient. So we show uh, and, uh, that uh, the patient had probably this guy in this type as, as predicted. And uh, uh, the the at the first, if, if you look at the data in this way, we see okay the the, the deficit is there, but it seems that there's no this, there's no language uh, specificity that we observed uh, uh, before. But actually, it was, and I show you then uh, the, the the data, who the data that, that we have and that support the this idea, and uh, uh, the point is that uh, to which extent uh, these mm, these these results are are specific to the, the problem the patient has or not. So some uh, years uh, later we had the chance to study one another bilingual patient single case study uh, that we are in very interested in study uh, semantic aspects of uh, bilingualism and we did uh, the same they start task and what we saw that that patient that had problem in, also in naming but the problem came from another another region another 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 problem in that case was semantic problem was completely able, was able uh, uh, to do to the task 
and she 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 performed as 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 as, as control as control uh, participants. So the one of the reason in this case is that. Uh, the patient that we tested, that is this, the, the RRT, had the problem at uh, subcortical level, and for this, this, for this reason, probably had problem in language language switching, and the patient at TC that had problem semantic problem, a specific lesion in the anterior part of the temporal lobe that we know is uh, causing a semantic dementia, and uh, uh, despite the fact that it was able uh, was had problems in naming, and she was a trilingual speaker, so she had problem in all the three languages, and was required to do language switching that we did in this case in English and, and, and Catalan because the, the first language of TC was, was English. She was uh, able uh, to, do, uh, to do the task. So when we went to uh, look at to, uh, the data uh, of the RQ patient, uh, we saw that uh, we found again this reactionality Despite the fact that overall seems that was uh, the, there was no difference between L1 and L2 or dominant and dominant languages, when we look at the number of language intrusion, we found that the number of language intrusion were higher in L1 in in, in Kaplan, as expected uh, from the connected speech, but uh, was not the case when the patient had to switch to, to Spanish. So uh, once again, we we see this kind of this reactionality. Did this, language, this language directionality uh, after the study was not surprising. At the beginning, it was. I didn't expect this kind of this, this, this specificity uh, of, of switching from one language because my idea is that, okay, you can expect this kind of deficit only in one language in case, the patient, in case you, you study a patient with the unbalanced uh, proficiency of the two languages because uh, one language is, is stronger than the other, so you can expect that uh, you, you, you use the, 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 the less effective language, but this was not the case, so my hypothesis was, was wrong at the beginning. But I went back to look at the data that were published for with single case uh, patient, and actually uh, I, was, uh, I was surprised by the fact that uh, almost every, uh, every paper reported that the, the, the problem of uh, switching in, in person with brain damage was only for um, to one language, let's say, and not for both languages. So patients have systematically uh, the, the behavior of switching to one language and not the other, uh, to the other language when um, we tested the language in a separate way. So uh, the question, uh, so the, the, can we, ask if the, the problem uh, of uh, language switching is something uh, specific or, or, or specific to some brain lesion. Um, from our data, the patient that we studied, uh, we were not able to, to conclude about this because we, we, the patient had multiple, multiple uh, lesions because it was a, a, she had multiple sclerosis, so she had several lesions, so we are not able um, to define uh, what was the source of um, her problem in terms of brain lesions. But it's true that uh, when we tested uh, uh, with similar tasks in other patients with brain lesions, we found at cortical level, we didn't find this behavior. So we see, for example, for the example they gave you uh, from semantic dementia, but also when we test a uh, uh, patient with Alzheimer's disease without any problem at um, in a subcortical level, or at least for basic ganglia, uh, one year uh, before uh, the first uh, the first test, we see that yes, pa patient uh, have a problem in uh, in in retrieving more and more because uh, the disease is, is progressing. But what we don't see is that when they have uh, severe deficits of naming because of the disease, they don't uh, produce more cross-language intrusion. So probably they uh, have more problem in, uh, in, in, in semantics. So they produce more semantic errors or, or definition of the words, or maybe uh, they are not able at all to name the pictures, but it's not frequent to find people with some dementia who do uh, uh, cross-language intrusion. So, 
there are some specificity, I would say that uh, there is kind of specificity and probably it is true that uh, this uh, comes from uh, subcortical lesions. So one of the points is that it's a problem at lexical level or language activation. This is, I think it's, 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 a, it's a question that sometimes is, is, is still open. Uh, in, I, see, I say open because uh, it's difficult to disentangle if it's a problem in uh, activating a language schema or more lexical level. There's a way to study this, for example, with money by manipulating uh, the cue the of the language and the cue of, of, the, of the stimuli. But uh, from our study, this was quite difficult because we have evidence for both things. Probably was the problem was more on uh, at um, language level because the problem were, were the, the deficits that the patient had were more in connected speech situation, more lexical level, but also we had evidence for lexical level. And one question that is, is, uh, is uh, related to one of the debates of the bilingual, uh, bilingual is, is the relation of this source of uh, language control problems or language control deficit, to which extent these are related to uh, uh, executive control or general domain uh, control. Okay, so uh, this is uh, one of the debates within uh, the, in the bilingualism research, because uh, we know that we have some evidence that the two systems uh, are overlapping, but uh, we have also some uh, cases in which uh, this overlap is not uh, uh, full. So what we, I didn't mention in case of our, uh, in our patient, we tested in executive control and actually uh, she had some problem also in executive control. But indeed, uh, uh, the, 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 the interesting thing is that when we test uh, TC, the second patient with semantic dementia, she had problem in executive control, but she didn't have a uh, problem in language control. So. The, the, the point is that to see at which level is the problem and which level uh, there is the interaction between the two systems. So uh, to explore more uh, this uh, control, uh, language control deficits and possibly the relations, uh, relationship with the uh, executive control, we, uh, we, we move to, to group studies, okay? Uh, so instead of, uh, uh, studying uh, only single key patient is sometimes very difficult because we have the chance uh, to find uh, these these people who have uh, this this problem. Sometimes uh, it's not a question that there's not this kind of patient, but sometimes it depends on, um, from uh, if, if if clinicians are are able to detect this kind of impairments. And so we, we, we move to, to, to a second strategy. This is also using in cognitive group psychology to, to study uh, a group of, group of patients with specific, uh, uh, specific neurological uh, disorders. Uh, so um, the strategy here is, is a bit different because we, if you want to do some cognitive neuropsychology, it's useful to go to a patient who have uh, these uh, some impairments that are related to what are you looking for, and this is you you have to base your research and your hypothesis on what is known, for example, from clinical neuropsychology. Okay, and uh, sometimes you 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 can uh, use uh, more than one group of patients. In this way, you can say, okay, it is known that this patient, this group of patients have this problem, the other one have another problem. You do a kind of uh, dissociation. So one way is to compare, for example, in this, in the same task, different uh, population of, of patients with different brain damage, or sometimes you can do uh, uh, different tasks that uh, are supposed to uh, tap in different uh, cognitive processes in the same population. So we started with Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease. So the reason is that we know that um, the, first, uh, the, the first symptoms of the disease uh, are mainly related to uh, dysfunction over uh, basal ganglia, okay? So, uh, and the, uh, so the, the dopaminergic problem that uh, uh, is uh, the, the cause of, of the disease 
and the movement disorder of people with Parkinson's disease uh, uh, have been related to to, to bazaganglin expansion. And uh, if you, so for, for us was important because if you remember, basal ganglia uh, uh, are uh, one of the main structures that are important in language, in language control. So in this case, uh, the question were uh, different and we decide at some point to, 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 to change also the question because uh, uh, in a parallel way, the bilingual literature was, was changing and new, idea, new ideas were coming. So we say, why we don't to test these also, this hypothesis or these ideas from uh, other research in, in, with, the, with the neuropsychological approach. So uh, we first, we, we, we wanted to know if uh, also, uh, uh, if we can, we were able to test these language difficulties, language switching deficits in, 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 in these patients that in principle, they don't have an overt problem in language control, but maybe they have if we, we, we use more, more experimental and more specific tasks. Uh, one other question is that to which extent uh, are very specific uh, are very specific to, to, to language or, 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 or something that is related to uh, a more um, executive control or other language, language uh, control abilities. So the first approach that we use uh, is to study with different tasks, uh, the same, the same uh, population. So we used uh, uh, language switching as a similar to uh, the version that I described uh, in, the, in the previous slide. And uh, we also test in the same population uh, executive control by uh, adapting language uh, switching uh, uh, to a non linguistic non linguistic version of the task. So the classical task switching task in which people are required to match uh, one, uh, one, 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 one figure, one, two uh, option based, for example, on color. And sometimes the, 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 you, you change the rule uh, by asking them to do the same by shape and so on and so on. So to reproduce the same situation, we should have some speech trials and some repeat trial. And uh, finally, uh, to see whether uh, this language control uh, ability was not restricted to, um, to language, um, to, to the two languages we tested also with an object action uh, verb, uh, sorry, in the action uh, switching task, which asked people to name the same picture, for example, as an object or as an action, and so switch uh, between these two options uh, to have switch and repeat trials. So the main result, to make this story, the story, the story short, uh, is that we consistently find that patients in, 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 in two groups of Parkinson's disease patients, we found that they uh, have a problem as compared to control in language uh, switching. Okay, so you see in, in the first columns of, of the results, but the patients had, um, didn't have any problem in other uh, switching tasks. So confirming that uh, even if they don't have an overt problem in language switching. When you use experimental uh, paradigm, you, you are able to see uh, this difference and these are specific, uh, uh, these problems are specific to the two, the two languages. The second question ca that uh, came after this series of studies that we did with Gabriela Cartane, a PhD student uh, at the lab, we, we moved to a similar population in terms that population who had and who have a problem uh, in, uh, in, in basal ganglia structure, more specifically uh, to uh, codates and, and, and putamen. This is Huntington disease. Huntington disease is a genetic uh, disorder uh, who have uh, the uh, symptoms that are moved, uh, movement disorder that's different from Parkinson because uh, in general, uh, um, the movement disorder uh, that um, Parkinson, Huntington disease have are more choreotic because it's like they are dancing instead of some um, Parkinson's disease problem in, in the slowing of the behavior or, or, or etc. Or, or more on, on, on balance. In, in the good thing to uh, to 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 study 
uh, this uh, language uh, difficulty or language uh, or language switching abilities in Huntington disease that you can do it in the pre-symptomatic uh, stage of the disease uh, because with the genetic testing you can you can know if the patient have uh, uh, have the disease and in few years and 10 years and 20 years we have uh, the symptomatic uh, the, the symptoms of, of, of the behavior. So we, we, we ask if the problem that is behind uh, language switching is a problem of uh, reconfigurate a new language. So the, the question is that uh, you are speaking a language, you have to start a new language. So is the problem is that to uh, prepare the new language in a way that uh, I have to switch, so I have to disengage one language and then have to start a new language. So research from healthy individuals have shown that if there's enough time between the cue uh, of the language and the stimulus presentation, uh, the switch cost uh, disappears. So the cost that you had when you switch the language. So typically, is that at least one second between the cue and the stimulus, the switch will disappear. So we tested it in, in patients with Huntington disease. Uh, remember that these people had, um, were at pre-symptomatic stage. So what we found that actually the, 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 the patients with uh, Huntington disease didn't have problem in, in switching course. So the switching course, I remember, uh, um, I remind you that is the difference uh, between switch trials and, and repeat trials. So they were not different from, from herd individuals, but what's, uh, uh, what we found is that when we look at the uh, second situations, say when the, the, the patient had enough time to prepare the second language, still have the same amount of switch course as in the simultaneous presentation of Q and, and, and stimulus. So it was not problem, a problem uh, per se of language uh, configuration, but probably is the, in the dynamic, dynamic uh, of language language uh, preparation. So we then ask if it was a problem in dealing with cross-language interference, because one of the things that you have uh, to do is that you have one language, you have that activate the, the, um, the second language, and the time that you are preparing the second language, you probably have a stage in which you have to compete or, or to select between two possible alternatives, okay? So we did it with the classical troop and we asked people to name the color of the words. So the words were uh, in the second language and uh, we asked people to name the color of the words in their first language. So in situation which you have to name, you have some interference from your certain language. And when we look at the data, actually we didn't find any, any, any problem uh, for uh, uh, Huntington disease patients in this style. So we say we exclude that the problem was that cross-language interference was more probably inactivating the language, language schema. Um, so uh, I was not convinced about this, this, this result, because uh, we also know that Stroop, the classical version of the Stroop is one of the main measure that uh, we and people use uh, to test executive control in patient with Huntington's disease, not only in the, in the bilingual version, but in the classical version of the Stroop. So I uh, decided to retest again uh, with the similar task in uh, in, dif oh, sorry, in different population. And uh, here in, in this graph, you have uh, the first one is uh, healthy controls. And then uh, we retest, uh, uh, we test uh, across the stroop uh, in, uh, in, in Parkinson's disease with the idea that they probably have uh, similar behavior because they have problem in basal ganglia and also in uh, and two, uh, let's say, non, non, non bas not, uh, basal ganglia disease, such as uh, Alzheimer's disease, AD, and MCI, that is uh, mild cognitive impairment, that is uh, defined as a preclinical pre stage of, of, the, of the AD dementia. Okay, we, we can think about this is not 
the uh, only definition of the disease, but usually it is defined uh, as the preclinical stage of, of dementia. So when we look at the result, we found that PD patients as did, as, uh, as uh, Huntington's this patient did, uh, didn't show any, any, they didn't show any problem in this task. So cross language interference was not, was not problematic. So uh, I thought that it was a problem. Uh, one of the, the explanation, it was that, okay, uh, cross language interference is not related to uh, basanglanglia, but it is more related to ACC, ACC, anterior uh, cingular cortex, is one of the area that uh, has been shown to be active during uh, cross uh, language uh, mm, to stroop task more than cross language interference. So I, I was thinking that also in, in the model proposed by Abutalebi, this cross language interference is more related to ACC. So uh, if this is true, I want to see uh, what happens in, in MCI and AD. And surprisingly, what we, we found is that they had some this, this kind of problem. So uh, now the question is how to explain this data. So we, we, we try to, to look at the more specific components by running a Gaussian analysis. Gaussian analysis allows you uh, to um, divide two main components. One is more related to a speed of processing. And the other one is related to the executive control part of the reaction time. So the idea is that if it's something that um, you can explain because uh, um, the patient is generally slow, is really affected, so it's affecting whatever whatever the patient is doing. So if it's executive control, maybe it's affecting only uh, the more demanding situation or more demanding condition of the task. So to some extent, the one of the explanation is that AD uh, perform uh, uh, differently from uh, all the other uh, the patients because they were slow. I mean, the, the explanation is that uh, they have dementia and so the speed of processing is so slow that uh, the, the, the effect is, it cannot be explained in, 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 speed, in terms of speed of processing and not executive control. But at MCI, it was not the case. So in the preclinical stage, it seems that uh, the most important part of the, this task is related to its executive control component and not uh, to speed of processing. The, there's a third explanation as well that maybe we are not looking only to the executive uh, component of this troop task, but only but probably related. We have to think that there's a language component and maybe uh, the situation, the, the explanation is that uh, if they are related in lexical retrieval and they have problem in retrieving words, uh, this uh, uh, also there is also a linguistic component that uh, are uh, that is affecting the, the behavior. So just a, 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 a summary in which uh, I just uh, summarize some of the evidence that we uh, have from this series of of, uh, of of studies in which the basal ganglion seem to have to play a role. In, 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 this, in this task and in language switching in general. So the, the, the other point is what about temporal lobe? So we know that temporal lobe is more related to, to language and not uh, speaking the two languages, but we have also some other studies showing that uh, temporal lobe uh, or some structure of the temporal lobe are related to, to bilingualism. And um, it's, I think it's, it's, it's still open, this, this, this question about uh, what about cross language interference. Probably we have many data from neuroimaging, but we don't have enough from neuropsychology to explain uh, what's going on in, in, in patients. So I think that uh, for, for what we, we know, what we have for uh, language control, uh, I uh, there are still some um, some 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 open, open questions that I think it could be uh, interesting to, to to test in in patient with brain damage. So I think it's this is uh, this is an idea that I I I, I really like to, to compare uh, voluntary language situation uh, to acute language condition of 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 switching. Say this kind of task in which is the person that. Uh, decide which which language to speak 
And we know that this is something different uh, from the acute language situation. And we know also that the mechanisms behind of voluntary language switching are probably different because we know there are some benefits uh, when we have we are free to speak the two languages that we don't have in more in, in, in acute language conditions. So I think it is interesting uh, to test uh, for especially uh, prefrontal uh, lesion and to say uh, to which extent is um, this kind of lesion is affecting the intention to speak or, the, or, the, or to, to, um, to implement uh, the, the language. So I think that to, to, to be sure that uh, in language control uh, is um, the basal ganglia is the only structure that is implicated in probably the connection of central lobe, I think it, it's, it's, it's uh, necessary to study other type of dementia as, as, as Alzheimer's disease. We don't have uh, data. We have some evidence um, from uh, old paper which we uh, know that there are some observation of change uh, of languages during the disease, but we, we don't have uh, a formal explanation or we don't have uh, very accurate uh, data on this. This is important because my, my, my hypothesis is that, okay, probably is not in, in, in dementia is not a question of how um, lesions are affecting the cognition, but the, also the connection of this area with, with other part of the language control system. Maybe know, we know that the executive control is affected and some working memory processes are affected in, in AD, so maybe this also affecting some language control abilities. And also, um, I think that the implementation part of the the, the language uh, control, uh, uh, all these um, um, abilities we have uh, to uh, as, as, as speech, uh, speech control or motor control of, uh, of, our, of our language is not uh, well, well studied or it's little study in, 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 the, in, the, in the context of uh, uh, language which is tasks. I think it's interesting to study in patients who have problem in, uh, in, in articulation, such as a practice of speech, to see whether, for example, the activation of selection at the lexical level is affecting or can modulate to some extent uh, at the level of the process. So I did a lot of relation with the brain. <laughs> I told you at the beginning of the talk that, uh, that the idea is to, 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 to go more on cognitive neuropsychology, but decided to, to mix the things, cognitive neuroscience and cognitive neuropsychology. So, but in the end, the question is, is cognitive uh, neuropsychology plausible in, in the context of uh, bilingualism? I think it is. And the one thing that if you want to, to explore or, or to follow, follow this, this path is uh, bilingual aphasia. Uh, we have a lot of a long tradition of, of language disorder in the field of bilingualism uh, for, with patients uh, with, uh, uh, with bilingual aphasia. And now we know uh, what is the most frequent pattern of language disorders uh, that is uh, more parallel and we have uh, only in few cases differential language impairment, the effect of language proficiency and the effect, for example, of uh, uh, treating one language on, on the other. But probably we, we now need uh, some more systematic and experimental works to, to need more, for example, about uh, uh, um, lexical retrieval and these kind of studies are needed to complement what we know from cognitive uh, uh, and uh, model of bilingual uh, speech production. So I give you a few examples that we study this in, in, in patients with bilingual aphasia to, the, to see uh, whether uh, the uh, problem that they have in, in, in naming to or lexical retrieval where um, could be explained in, in terms of language competition or, and especially whether uh, the two languages uh, were affected or were similar uh, processed in, 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 in bilingual in bilingual people. So uh, this is more theoretical question whether uh, actually uh, in the end uh, speaking two languages is 
similar to speak one language, at least for some uh, retrieval, uh, lexical retrieval processes. So the idea was to study this in, in, in patients and to see whether um, the two languages were uh, similarly affected at low level of processes, not indicated overall. So we used uh, a different uh, context to, to, to see whether um, some components uh, of the of the language uh, processes uh, can could explain uh, this deficit. So we focus on um, on the semantic context and phonological context by using two uh, classical tasks uh, that are the cycling naming tasks. So this task uh, where you have to ask people to name pictures, and when you in one homogeneous condition, so uh, um, item of the same uh, semantic category compared to uh, the same pictures, but in uh, um, uh, unrelated uh, uh, condition. So not the same uh, semantic category. What we know from, from Hertz individual is that you have this semantic interference effect, say that you uh, get uh, you get slower when you have to name the same pitch, same uh, the picture of the same uh, semantic category compared to uh, different uh, category, and this uh, effect that you see is across repetition because you present uh, four or five six times the same the same uh, the same picture, and when what is what are you changing is the, is uh, is the context. So we compare this task. Uh, to the uh, phonological task, so same situation, but instead of uh, showing pictures sharing the uh, same semantic category, we uh, use pictures that uh, um, shared um, the first, the, the initial segment of the word, the same syllable, let's say, so the same situation, uh, uh, related and unrelated. So uh, the idea to explore the second hypothesis is because it was not clear if uh, the, the, the phonology is helping us in retrieving words, or is is not? Because we have some data from uh, um, healthy individual uh, showing that there's kind of, there's a facilitation, but this is not uh, a, a consistent finding across studies. So uh, what we uh, and um, what we study in this case is uh, a language uh, language uh, language performance in, in patients with bilingual aphasia and uh, we had to be sure that uh, it was not a, a problem in um, how the two languages uh, were affected by the disease we we studied the patient in the current stage uh, of uh, their language uh, disorder that they were fluent because uh, otherwise they were not able to they were not able to do uh, to do the task that uh, before uh, stroke, uh, they uh, were patients that uh, were high proficient in two languages. And at formal uh, assessment of the two languages, they didn't show any difference between the two languages. So they, they, they were similar affecting in both languages. So this is what it was important for, for, for us because, uh, 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 of course, if one language is more affected than the other, it's expected that you probably uh, the two the lexical mechanisms that they are using are different in two languages or differentially affected. So the important thing that the language impairment was was the same for the two languages. So uh, the interesting result is that in, in the semantic version, we uh, for accuracy we 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 saw that across repetition uh, people had more and more problems. The accuracy was the accuracy was lower in the related condition compared to our related condition. But surprisingly, uh, we found uh, that um, in the phonological version, what we, we made the hypothesis that patients were uh, uh, more accurate in the condition in which they had to name a uh, picture with the same uh, first syllable as uh, we didn't find this. We we actually found found the the, the opposite. So uh, in the phonological condition, if patient had to name uh, the same um, picture with the same syllable, where, uh, the, the patient were less accurate. So this is, was quite surprising because in speech and language uh, therapy, sometimes uh, uh, it's 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 very very common to use phonological cues. Uh, to help people to retrieve the words. So it was a quite unexpected. So I think the, the good thing to, to have the two versions of the, of the task uh, was that we were able 
uh, to explain um, the two language uh, naming deficits in the same way. In this, in this case, we didn't explain uh, according to co-competition because this is this was an, was not a good option uh, for phonological version of the task. But we thought that uh, increment, incremental word, incremental learning was the only possibility. So this idea that you strengthen the association or you strengthen the association between uh, the item and the, the phonological um, features or semantic feature across repetition is something that you you strengthen along. Uh, the, the task and this is something that is incremental and this is uh, not important if it's for knowledge of semantic but the general mechanism that is uh, behind your uh, say lexical, lexical, lexical system or or lexical retrieval uh, abilities and uh, uh, also uh, uh, we show that um, the uh, language impairment uh, so um, in the semantic version task, patients show differential, uh, differential language um, deficits in the sense in the task, but not in the phonological. So one thing that you, uh, when you observe this, 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 this phenomenon of, uh, of some change for, for languages or some, some changes for some task condition, the good thing is go through individual data. So one thing that you can do with patient is you can do also, of course, with, with health individuals, but uh, to see how many patients show this, this, this pattern. So what we found, for example, uh, we found that uh, non-dominant language was more affected uh, in the sem semantic task. And in most of the patient, it was the case, but it's true also that you have some cases, for example, no, if in, in, in this case of patient two or in patient five, that you see that there was a no clear difference between the, uh, the, the, the first, the, the dominant and non-dominant language, okay? So, uh, and I think that the good thing to look at uh, into individual, uh, look at the, at the performance at individual level is to say that uh, what we what we found in this case is that uh, the different uh, the different patterns that we that we see in, in this patient was not explained by the type of the phasia that we have. There were patients with fluent aphasia, but we had different types of uh, uh, fluent aphasia. So the result is that. Uh, it doesn't matter the type of aphasia you have. You have uh, differences uh, within the same type of aphasia, or we have the same pattern with two patients with the different types of aphasia. This is interesting because uh, you go beyond the clinical uh, conceptualization of aphasia, and you go beyond also the possible uh, neural uh, uh, neural um, signature of, of of the deficit. So we also uh, uh, moved, uh, uh, let's say, uh, forward in, in, in this in, in this line of of of, um, of um, naming deficits and language lexical retrieval abilities in bilinguals, and we tested whether this problem that people have in uh, uh, in uh, in retrieving words in the semantic context was due to more executive control deficits or the fact that we are not able to, to retrieve the, 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 the words per se. The, the hypothesis was that there was an ex for executive control that here you see the, the framework uh, of the uh, semantic control network proposed by Lamor Ralph and colleagues, in which we have two main components. One is more representational. We represent our knowledge of the world, the conceptual that we have of the, of the objects, for example. And one is the ability to retrieve this, this, kind, of, uh, this kind of things. Um, and we know that uh, stroke aphasia have affects more the control part, so the ability to retrieve. Whereas semantic dementia is is not uh, is affecting more the representational part. So when we test, we compare in the same with the same task, uh, the, um, one patient with bilingual dementia and the patient with semantic semantic aphasia, or people who have problem in a Turing word uh, in, in in semantic aphasia in in, in, the, in semantic task. Sorry. So what we what we saw is that semantic dementia uh, uh, did not show this kind of semantic interference. So the, so the explanation was that the representation is so deteriorated that there's no competition 
at all among the possible candidates that you have to retrieve in the, in the semantic context. Instead, uh, patients with, with stroke aphasia, aphasia have a problem in um, uh, more semantic interference effect compared to this control and also more in second language. So I think I, I go to, uh, straight to, 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 my, to the end of, of my talk. And uh, before, uh, uh, before ending, uh, before uh, concluding uh, of what uh, neuropsychology is telling us or how it's useful to, to investigate uh, deficits in, in bilinguals, I think that the next step that we, that we can do in the context of language disorder is to move uh, to neurodegenerative diseases and especially to patients uh, with frontotemporal delay, dementia and specifically to the uh, PPA variant because we have enough clinical data and we have enough um, neuroimaging data and that uh, are uh, so useful to make strong uh, hypotheses uh, of the different level of the, uh, of the language might be affected by the uh, specific components of the disease. PPA, you have at least three variants and each variant has specific uh, brain lesion and specific linguistic uh, deficits. So I think that we can translate a very well uh, to the bilingual context, what is going on uh, in this patient, if you can uh, predict for each variant of this type of aphasia, what is going on. There are some studies that are, um, that are conducted now for in, with, with, with bilingual patient with PPA, but I think it's, it's, uh, it's uh, the, the new field, I think, of the neuropsychology of language in the context of bilingualism. And uh, this, I think it's, it's extremely important to design, for example, task uh, in which we uh, compare a different system of production and perception, or to study, for example, uh, um, bilingual language control in, uh, in a non-fluent agrammatic uh, variant of uh, PPA or the, all the phonological uh, um, components that are um, engaged in bilingual language control, and this is, can be easily tested in patients with locopenic variants of uh, PPA. So, just to to conclude, I would say that we can implement a strong version of the current psychology, but I think is that we can also uh, think about to a weak uh, cognitive psychology in which we can integrate the neuroscience part. And the neuroscience part for me is useful to make prediction and also to test the neural model as well, because we, we can at some point show that we have enough uh, patient data that are not uh, uh, explaining what that region is, is predicting. So I think it's uh, important the use of experimental pipelines because they're very useful in terms of uh, explanation and something that we have to look at at uh, error analysis. And this is something that we can do only with patient data. So it's important also to compare uh, patients with different pathologies or using different tasks that are supposed to have different type of linguistic processes within the same uh, group of patients. And I think it's uh, neurodegenerative diseases is kind of special cases that is, um, is, is, is useful uh, to, to, to use as, as a model to study bilingual bilingual control, bilingual speech production, but not only, but also uh, cognition related to, to bilingual to bilingualism, because uh, we have the chance to, to know uh, the, the lesions of uh, the brain lesions that are uh, related, say, uh, to each type of uh, neurodegenerative disease, but also uh, they allow, for example, to do a follow-up of the, the performance across time to a specific production of which type of deficit uh, we can expect uh, across time. So if you are now interested in neuropsychology and you don't know nothing about neuropsychology, I think one way is uh, to, to start with non-scientific or not, not, not papers. So here do you have some few suggestions suggestion of famous books from uh, the neurology 
largest uh, Oliver Sachs. Uh, the, the, his books are really exceptional because we have clinical description of single cases of different uh, disorders in, in, in a very, very, very interesting. Uh, you have uh, the, the, the books from uh, Susan uh, Sullivan, who is uh, a neurologist, but she also uh, uh, writing books uh, uh, from her clinical experience, experience with, uh, with patients with epilepsy and the deficit they have. And uh, in the end, you have also a movie in which you have the possibility to see what is uh, uh, the, the an early onset uh, AD for a famous uh, linguist and what is the problem of language uh, who Alice had in, uh, in her, her life due, uh, from the, the, the onset of the disease. And then I recommend you also a fantastic interview to Barbara Wilson, who is one of the uh, women uh, of, the, of the neuropsychology and uh, she's, uh, she's very She's very interesting and she's very she she's a, she's a pioneer in, in the field of neuropsychology so many thanks for your attention and uh, i'm happy to to answer your question now <laughs>